Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you'd like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today we're really lucky we have returning guest, William Bust. Hi, William. Hi, Judith. How are you? I am very good, thank you. Good. Good to be back. <laughs> and for those that don't know you, what do you do and who are you? <laughs> who am I and what do I do? Um, well, I work with business owners predominantly, um, helping them with strategy and working towards building the better business that they want. Of course, better is a subjective uh, a subjective thing. What's better for me uh, may not be the same as what's better for you. So one of the first things I'll do is, is work with my clients to understand what a better business for them looks like, and then we plan how to get there. And uh, my predominant working style is to help develop the right plans and then hold people accountable for delivering them. Um, and uh, and that's what I do. That sounds really good. So it's a bit like Better by Abuse, is it? Well, uh, I do. I run a little training uh, course, a free training course, actually, once a month in Vapiano's in London when I do my first Friday working lunch, which I call Abuse to Your Business. Um, so it's it's all about getting good business advice, tangible business advice that people can put into practice straight away. Um, so if anybody does want to come along to that, I'm sure you can share with them at the end the details of how to pick that up. Sure. What I'll do is I'll add that to the listening notes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Cool. So I think it'd be really interesting to talk about why Mavericks need to look after themselves. Yeah, indeed. Um, and well, why business people generally, but perhaps Mavericks in particular. Um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, on, uh, before we spoke today um, and I uh, have been through quite a few changes in my life with uh, you know emotional changes uh, physical changes uh, you know I'm getting older for one thing I was, I was <laughs> once young and now uh, not so much um, and I had a 60th birthday last year so you know it's it, time has moved on and that has some impact on things like physical well-being and on all of those emotional parts of the journey, the, um, the mental resilience that you need to run a business and, and physical well-being to be able to, to, to actually be there and do it, um, I think are really important. And one of the challenges I think that the more maverick people have, uh, me included, is that some of that gets pushed to one side if there's either something really exciting that's going on in your life that you want to focus on, you know, new product, new service, new part of the business, or that there's some uh, challenge going on, perhaps because you're behaving in a little bit of a maverick way. Um, and, and that can ultimately come and bite you, I think, and take, um, take its toll. I think that's really fair. It just struck me there. There's a couple of fictional characters that do the same thing, don't they? You have uh, Spock from Star Trek, who doesn't eat when he needs to work. And he says he doesn't eat, need to eat or sleep for three days. And then obviously you've got um, Sherlock, on TV, who again doesn't need to eat or drink when he's working, um, and I'd probably put both of those as quite maverick, willfully independent individuals. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and it's and it's very easy to fall into those habits if you're not aware of your own habits enough, hmm. um, and, and not aware of the consequences of them. Yeah, it reminds me of a time when I was much younger <laughs> um, and I worked in, I was a senior manager in a retail organisation and every Christmas everyone's on the shop floor and I remember all senior managers were scheduled to work seven days in a row over Christmas with probably somewhere between two and four hours sleep in between. Yeah. So, yeah. And it was seen as normal and if you couldn't cope then there was something seriously wrong with you. Yeah. There's not something seriously wrong with you. It's, uh, I don't think anybody can cope with that. They can have coping strategies, but it doesn't mean they're coping. So what's the effect then when people... Because I think there is a serious risk, especially with Mavericks, for burnout. Um, because you just think you're strong, 
it needs to be done there's no one else who can do it it has to be you and you just keep going so what is the risk of burnout and what can be done about it well i think it's yeah i think it's 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 deeper than that actually mm-hmm. um in that um i have a tell a little bit of my story it'll, it'll then make sense but um i was uh, about 10 years ago i got a bad cold turned into a chest infection uh, i did nothing about it because you know if it's just a cold i'll get better right you know, <laughs> as you do and it got worse and worse and um and in the end i ended up at four in the morning waking up in some severe pain and being taken off in an ambulance with pneumonia Gosh. um and uh, you know there was a point um when various things started happening that made me think actually this is rather more serious than i thought you know there were conversations about dart of organ failure and you know those kinds of things which was a bit bit worrying a little bit concerning um and you know i'm fine so you know let's not dwell too much on that but it 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 started a a journey that took probably 10 years from start to finish and and it started because at the end of that i was you know put on antibiotics i recovered that was fine the following winter i got another cold i started to get the same symptoms i went to the doctor much earlier second time you know you don't make the same mistakes twice again um you know they, they did some tests and said you've got pneumonia again but we've got it much earlier so i was on another dose of antibiotics and at that point they put me on steroid inhalers because i've always suffered from asthma um, related to hay fever and they concluded that because i had these asthmatic lungs that they weren't clearing out the the rubbish when i got a cold and that was therefore getting infected so that's fine uh steroid inhalers it is how long do i need to take these for i said well for the rest of your life was the answer so that's a bit you know a bit kind of well that's, i'm not sure i want to do that um and a few years later i got quite bad acid indigestion very regularly and thought i better go to the doctors about this as well it's not usual so something's changed um, they did a, an endoscopy, you know, camera down your throat, had a look at the top of my, uh, my esophagus joints of stomach and said there's some, you know, early signs of quite bad acid erosion. And that can be a precursor to cancer of the esophagus, which is not very pleasant. So, you know, here's some um, antacid, um, but what they call proton pump inhibitors. It's a drug that stops your stomach producing as much acid. Um, okay, how long do I need to take these for? Well, for the rest of your life. Um, so now I'm on two drugs for the rest of my life and that was a turning point for me it was a point when I thought actually there has to be you know they're medics so they they prescribe medicine it's what they do you know to them these are the the nail for their hammer Mm. there has to be another way and and so I started doing some research and one of the things about the acid indigestion was lose a bit of weight and get fitter Um, and that will tend to diminish or eliminate the symptoms so I thought, well, that's something I can do. Um, so I was about 12 and a half stone at the time. Um, I'm now uh, about 10 stone 10. Oh, wow. So that's a couple of stone lighter uh, near enough, which is a big difference. I've not taken, I've not gone out and dieted. Um, and I think there's a really important point here, which we may come on to later when we talk about, if we talk about some of the emotional side of this and what's going on from an emotional point of view. I just changed a few things and gradually lost the weight which is great but i also was doing more exercise because i wanted to get fitter and that will help i got fitter the acid indigestion went away i don't take those drugs at all anymore i've been symptom free for two years Brilliant. Um, but interestingly i don't get asthma anymore either and i haven't oh. taken the i haven't taken the uh, inhalers the steroid inhalers for two years um and i've had a number of colds in the meantime without any issue you know so that's gone so i'm off all the drugs um and you know that to me is one of those things about i'm not saying that this is me and i'm going to be really clear to the listeners you know you you have to do this with medical supervision despite my kind of joke about them they prescribe medicines yes they do they also know what they're doing yeah Um, (laughs) that's kind of key and i'm not giving medical advice here i'm saying this is what happened for me and it doesn't mean it will happen for you but it, it's, it was really the point about how that changed my, my mental view about how I control my uh, health and, and, uh, and my own well-being. And that change in physical well-being has made me much more mentally resilient as well. Mm. And that's just another side effect that I can, 
uh, I can take uh, the ups and downs, the slings and arrows, as Shakespeare would say, of, of life uh, with much more, um, I mean, I'm sure that some people would disagree with me, you know, I still have a temper, you know, it doesn't go away. Um, but but it's, I, I'm, I feel much more like I'm taking a, a, a level course through life rather than one that was full of rather, you know, bigger ups and downs. Um, and that too comes, I think, from the emotional side of it, you know, being aware of my emotions more. Um, and thinking more about, you know, when am I ang- when I'm feeling like I'm getting angry? What is it that's driving that anger? And, and being able to label it and think about it, and you know, stop and be rational in an irrational situation. Um, and and those, so those three things together have all uh, helped to make uh, things go a m- much smoother. Now, the impact of that on the business is that my business results are consistent. Um, the business has gone from being you know, highly profitable one month to highly loss making the next to breaking even the one after that to no money for three months to lots of money for three months, you know, and all over the place to a business that's producing pretty reliable revenues, pretty reliable profits month in, month out. Um, and, you know, that too has an effect on the emotions and the mental resilience. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it, it what I think I've done is I've broken what was a vicious cycle of being relatively unfit, being relatively, you know, not looking after myself, therefore not looking after the business, therefore having these ups and downs in the business, which made me, you know, worry more about where the next pound was coming from, therefore eating too much, putting on weight, you know, and the whole thing was a vicious cycle. And you turn that around and go the other way and the business starts really performing you know much better too yeah i think that makes sense because we're all one big ecosystem aren't we and it's about how can there be business health if you're not healthy and if you don't have your priorities right then nothing's right and i think sometimes uh i think every business owner runs the risk of really putting the client first rather than themselves and that can really drive stuff yeah, well I'm, I'm not even sure that it's putting the client first i think it's I think it's putting yourself at the back of the queue uh-huh. um, rather than putting somebody else at the front of it. Um, and and I, there's a subtle difference there because I think when you're putting yourself at the back of the queue, you're not necessarily looking after the customer either. It True. could be all sorts of other things that are, you know, if you've got kids, it might be, you know, that you're, you, know, you might put them at the back of the queue as well. You know, this it's more a case of, I think we get into this emotional state of, it's a kind of overwhelm, yeah. but it might not feel overwhelming. Um, you know, how long's your to-do list, Judith, right now? It's a lot less than it was about a week and a half ago. I nearly killed myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it, to-do lists are interesting because... Because most people have a to-do list that's 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 got lots of stuff on it that they don't get to, and I think you know, and it, it, this is part of the sailing smoothly through life thing. I, I now have this thing of well, if if I don't get to it, it wasn't that important anyway, right? Um, because the important stuff will riffle itself to the top of the list. There are times, you know, when there are things on my to-do list, and I think I really need do need to get round to that at some point, and it might start to play on my mind. Um, and, and it's that playing on your mind that is what I'm talking about, really, that it's not necessarily it's a client piece of work. It might be something for the kids or something for, um, you know, a relative somewhere else, or it might be about remembering somebody's birthday, and then the next time you remember it, it's three weeks after their birthday and you've forgotten you're a cruel, heartless so-and-so. Um, you know, whereas if you're kind of sailing smoothly through things, the, 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 list, is, the list isn't important anymore. What's what's the individual things on it are important, and the important ones are important. Um, but the fact that there's a thousand and one things on the list no longer concerns me. Different emotional state. I think that's quite interesting because I don't, for a start, I don't do lists. So that's, I kind of hesitate with lots of I'm thinking to do lists. I don't think we've got one. <laughs> um, I actually, that's what my mavericks of. I hate to do less because I feel like I'm being driven by the list. Even if I put the stuff on it, it feels like I'm being told what to do and I can't handle that. So I tend to 
put things in a calendar, as in this needs to be, no, this is the day I work on this, or this is the day this needs to get done. So I tend to open up the calendar and see what's in the calendar. Um, but it's really interesting because the last couple of weeks, I had probably three and four key projects that need to be done, and I was working, but I also had the priority of other things, that personal things I wanted to do as well, so I was I probably done three days where I got up at three thirty in the morning to work through, so I could have you know three or four hours gap in the in the day to do the other stuff, and then worked again to the evening. But it was in that period I I suddenly became aware that this is not sustainable. Because I think mm. in the past I would just kept on going, and it was I did it for about three or four days. And I was beginning to, it was just started off kind of low level, this is a lot of work, but that's okay, because I think, you know, Mavericks enjoy the challenge, and the fact to push themselves to limits, so it was kind of fun, and then I was, and then I was like, eh, it's not quite so much fun anymore. <laughs> um, but that has meant that, that this week, it's been relatively empty, so, you know, I've done the things that needs to be done, but also spent hours... Um, doing the things for me um, which I don't think I would have had the maturity even a year ago mm, mm. Um, well you know that, that whole thing of uh, Mavericks start businesses in order to work for themselves mm-hmm. rather than being in that nasty controlling environment of having a boss who tells them what to do um, I don't know what they're talking about <laughs> uh, yeah and he's not competent to tell them in the first place um, <laughs> you know so we, we set up our own businesses and then what happens we, you know we work all the hours that are available and some more. Um, and then when those hours are finished, we, we work some more. And, uh, you know, part of the reason for setting up in the first place was to have some freedom and not to be chained to, um, not to be chained to a, a boss. And now our boss is ourselves. And, you know, that, that can be, that can be quite an emotionally difficult thing to deal with as well. Um, you know, so you've got to, if you're only answering to yourself, and you're not very good at holding yourself accountable, you're not going to do much. If you're super efficient at holding yourself accountable, you'll overdo it and, and do the sorts of things that you were just talking about, you know, getting up in the middle of the night because you've got to get 12 hours working in the next day. Otherwise, your boss, you, is going to give you a hard time for not having done it. Yes, and I think, I think a year ago or even a few years ago, I would have said, this is the way... It needs to be done. Whereas I made a this time round, I made a conscious choice to to do it because I valued something else for me. You know, I, so I could have said, "No, I'll just get up normally and just carry on and put myself at the back of the queue." Whereas I looked at it and said, "I'll take a short term sacrifice because I want two three days completely free with no clients and no work because I've got stuff I want to do for myself." Um, so it felt like a choice. A real choice because I haven't gone back to. I now need yeah. to catch up. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're, I think you're right there. And I think, um, funny enough, somebody was asking me recently about resilience and how do you become uh, resilient. And I think there's a few things, isn't there? There's the technical things, but there's also how do you become resilient in your mental capacity? You know, how do you mm. pick yourself up? Or how do you push forward? It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like you have to know yourself quite well to know where you're at. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, my, uh, my underlying business, I mean, I trade mostly just under the William Beast name uh, these days because people buy me, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. and they work with me. And that's the work that I want to do is one-to-one work with people who know me and like me and want to work with me and to whom I add value. So that's all great. But my limited company is called Abelard. And, and I really had no idea that the choice of the name for my business, uh, nine, when was it, 2004, 15 years ago, um, actually put an enormous emotional constraint on me that I wasn't aware of. Um, so it was called Abelard uh, because it was a pen name that my mother chose at the end of the war when she, was, uh, she left a job. She worked in the war office during the war in London. Um, and the women that she worked with wanted to keep in touch with each other, but they were all going back to a whole host of different parts of the country. She would have been 44, she would have been 20, 21 years old at that point. Um, and 
they decided to write a correspondence magazine, which they each wrote a letter, put it in a folder. It went round as a round robin to everybody. And then when you got the folder back, you had your last letter now had lots of notes written on it from the people who'd read it. And you could write another letter, answer the questions that they'd asked and, and bring people up to date. But of course it was just post-war and mail was still intercepted and things. So they used pen names rather than their real names just for security. It's a bit like a blog, really, in today's yeah, world. Yeah, I sort of think it's like a Facebook feed, well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, and it's just, you know, without an internet, what do you do to do the same thing? Well, there you go. That, that's what they did. So she wrote those letters from uh, 1945 until 2008, three years before she died. Um, so, you know, whatever that is, 50, nearly 60 years worth. We've got them all, still got them all. Um but she used the pen name Abelard because Abelard was a writer of letters. He was a 12th century French monk that was separated from his muse. Uh, and they wrote letters to each other. They were, you know, an enforced separation. They wrote letters to each other for years, which still exist. I think they're in the, um, somewhere in one of the museums in Paris. Um, and uh, so Peter Abelard was the writer of letters. My mother was called Eloise. His lover was called Eloise. So, you know, that's where the, the sort of nice romantic twist to that. And um, when my father started a company, he called it Abelard. He retired, put it on the shelf. When I needed a company, I called it Abelard. So why does any of that give me an emotional constraint? Well, because there was a point about three months after my mother died in 2011, um, when I just sat up in bed one morning and thought, oh, it's mine now. And then I had this dreadful thought, what do I mean it's mine now? It's been mine all along. Gosh. Um, and I, and I realized that it hadn't actually been mine. I'd been running it kind of to prove something to somebody other than me. Uh -huh. You know, and my father originally, then my, after he died, my mother, you know, there's, a, there's this whole thing of a whole load of emotional baggage that unwound itself. Um, and that was quite interesting. So I then started questioning myself. See, there's the maverick in me. That was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> um, I then started asking myself, what else is buried in my head that is emotionally constraining me that I have no knowledge of right now? Because I've had no knowledge of that from 2004 until 2011-12. You know, it's yeah. eight years of running a business constrained emotionally from doing so in the way that I wanted to do it without knowing that I was constrained. It was a bit interesting. Um, so I really started spending time thinking about, you know, what, what emotions am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling them? What was the trigger for that? What's going on? Trying to really just self-analyze all the time. And, you know, there's a number of books and things on, on you know, that I've read that helped me to do that. And there's some, you know, I've, I've had talked to lots of people who have some insights into that kind of thing. Um, but fundamentally, it was about, you know, when, a, when an emotion comes along and hits you, it only lasts for a second or two. But, you know, you know that kind of rush of anger when somebody's done something that you find really offensive or, you know, somebody starts talking about Brexit or, you know, any of those things that can trigger us these days. Um, but, but in that moment when you're, you know, to use this modern term, triggered, the moment when you feel the rush of adrenaline is just to think, cast your mind back immediately into what are the things that have just happened that caused that. Because if you can label and tag them, it's not normally the immediate thing. You know, somebody can talk about Brexit and I won't get angry, even if they're talking complete nonsense. But, you know, another time somebody will say exactly the same thing and I will get angry. So what's the difference? It's not what they're saying in that moment. It's a whole host of contextual things that have happened up to that point. And when you start to get to grips with the context of what's causing those emotions, then you can start to take control a bit more. Uh, and I don't mean that in a controlling way. I just mean that you, you start to get some choice. And you can start to see things that will ultimately lead you to getting angry or upset and choose not to do them or choose to walk away from those conversations or choose to go in a different direction. But equally well, if you start to recognize the thing that brings you joy and enjoyment and pleasure and laughter and fun, you can choose to do those, to, to do those things and create the context ahead of time. And... You know, so I know, you know, if I'm heading down a path now, I can kind of sense this is, you know, I'm going to have a bad day today unless I change something. So I'll get up and go and walk the dog. Or I'll get up and, you know, because that's right. I'll get up and go and take some photographs. 
because I enjoy the photography and I enjoy trying to capture a good image. So if I can do that for 10 minutes, that I've broken the chain of things that would take me down an emotional road that I don't want to go down. But that's taken me, my mother died in 2011. It's taken me eight years of working on this and it's still a work in progress. But, but that sense of having a little bit more choice around the emotions that I feel is where the resilience comes from. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's a worthy cause. I mean, in my book, um, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders, I do talk about the way socialised mavericks view things and they can be seen quite dispass- as very dispassionate people because the emotions are observed rather than reacted to. And that's what you're mm-hmm. describing there is that, you know, you become aware and you immediately go, why? Why am I upset about this? Or why do I? And then you can then you learn from it. It's like an active process until it becomes a subconscious process. And I think that and that I think that enables more objectivity because you're not triggered by or if you are, you're aware of that. So it takes a different pathway. Oh, and I think you know the thing about choices. You can choose to say, actually, I am going to let myself get angry about this. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but I know why that's happened. I know the context in which it's happening. And so not, not only do you allow yourself to get angry, but you're much better able to deal with yourself in the angry state. And you can rather than, the, rather than someone else. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you can, st- you can step out of it as well. Um, I did a, a, a speech a couple of weeks ago about um, some of this stuff. Uh, to a group of professional speakers. So nothing, nothing like putting yourself through the ringer, you know, stand up in front of your peers and talk. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting that in that environment, um, and this is really just an example of it, ha- of it happening. I told the story I've just told you about my, uh, you know, my mother's correspondence magazine, whatever. Uh, and in this context, very comfortable doing that, standing on a stage doing it, you know, there was a whole host of other emotions that were playing around at a kind of just below the surface level. Um, and I, you know, made a, you know, I had to make a conscious choice of whether I let them surface or tried to keep them under the surface. And I chose to let them surface. It was the right decision, um, you know, because it, it was, you know, it gave the speech a lot more power mm. and a lot more, uh, you know, lots of people were recognizing things in their life about their relatives that they've lost and so on. And, and it gave them a chance to kind of really rationalize some of the things they felt as well. Um, so, you know, that, and that comes from having the choice because it was a, I distinctly remember it was a conscious choice. It was, you know, yeah. Okay. Let's let this surface a little bit. That's okay. Yeah. I, I can totally get that. It's about choosing when to be vulnerable and when, and when to, lose some control and when not to I think mm. it was like you said before was quite interesting about about that very journey because it made me think about myself and it and in a sort of similar way is that I don't as you say don't trade under a company name anymore because it doesn't feel like that's me and I think it's like I think when you start going into business and you, especially when you come out of corporate life at a senior level you're kind of trying to recreate the same thing that you left which is ridiculous because no one's gonna you know you can't market like a corporate because you're not one you're not coca-cola you know no <laughs> you can't do that thing because but you don't get that for a while and unless you're lucky to meet other people on the way who say don't be such an idiot you need to be more personal and i think sometimes you hear that kind of be personal and still have a corporate mindset and i found that after i wrote the book because i you know a period of time really reflecting as to who I am, what I am, what do I want to do, and all this kind of stuff. Um, by writing the book, I found it really cathartic because, like, my inner maverick really come out and shines and said, like, here I am, stop hiding me. And I think, yeah. and I, think yeah. I realised that over time, I kind of kept some of that in because, which it sounds really terrible. <laughs> Like it's everything I say now. Anyway, I've learned. Um, <laughs> I kind of keep it, kind of keeping it slightly in a box because it was like if I let it out too much, then I'm not going to be acceptable. I'm not going to fit in, which is bizarre because what Maverick really wants to fit in, and that was the cognitive dissonance. That's the 
I am not totally uncomfortable because I'm not my real self. And I think over the last few years, it's been the more I've just gone, this is who I am. I've lived my true values. People have seen that. I'm more happy. Business is better. People are the people I want to work with or people I can help are more attracted to me because I am who I am. You know, I don't need to hide it anymore. I don't even know why. I, don't, I think too many years at the senior level made me think I had to hide some of it. Um, and I think the difference was I was very much, I think all Mavericks are really good at this, very much in a compartment box. You know, this is me at work and this is me outside of work. Yeah. And yeah. quite me whereas I now I think I, I feel like I have a blended life where this is just you know I may behave differently but I'm not a different person in that behavior yeah and I think I I, I mean I entirely agree with that and I I, I think there's uh, you can kind of tell um, when I sit down with with clients you know businesses they may have been in existence for 10 minutes or 10 years uh, but there's a point when they kind of let go of this idea of um, I'm trying to build what I had when I was in a job. Yeah. Um, and and as I say, sometimes that happens very quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time. And, you know, I talk to people who say, you know, what kind of, what, what's your kind of role model? Who would you, you know, what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm trying to build a business like Steve Jobs or like, like um, Richard Branson or whatever. And uh, and then you talk to them about what that means to them, and they're talking about the business that Richard Branson has today, or the business that yeah. Steve Jobs had, you know, at, at the end of his time at Apple before he died, you know, that they're they're running a big uh, organisation, a big corporate company, effectively, and and that's their view of what they want to be running. But what they're not doing is asking what was what was Steve Jobs doing a year after he founded Apple with Steve Wozniak. What were they actually doing? What was their day like then? Because that's the day they should be having now if they're a year old. You know, and, and the same with Richard Branson. I you know, I know a bit about Richard Branson's story. You know, he, he, he was lucky in that Mike Oldfield came to him with a record that the record companies had all refused and he had access to a recording studio. So he recorded it. What he, what he did was work out how to market it because he's a marketeer and a salesman, you know. But at that time, he didn't have a brand. He didn't have, uh, you know, didn't have offices. He didn't have staff. He didn't have any of those things. What he did was focus on how do I get this one product to market in a way that the record, the other record companies can't compete with. I've got to do something different. And, you know, it's, that, it's taking that lesson and say, right, now, if you want to build a business like Richard Branson's, you have to start right back down there with one product that you're going to, you know, disrupt the market with. How are you going to do that? And, and generally speaking, you know, that's the point when I get blank looks, which yeah. is fine, which is fine, because, that, you know, that's just getting them into the place where we can start talking about, well, what does it look like? It's just they haven't, they've been in this place of, I want to have a big organisation like Steve, like, like, uh, Branson so I've got to go out and hire people um, and they haven't got the product or the services or the revenue to hire them and that catch-22 doesn't work I think yeah I think that's really interesting because I've just done uh, a podcast with uh, Dr. K on uh, the millennial paradox and we have exactly the same conversation where we say and we actually use the same example which is terrible um, about you know <laughs> Steve Jobs and, and I was saying They've missed it. They forgot the garage. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're like, "Oh, look at him now! It's got this." It's like, "Yeah, but he had a garage." <laughs> you know, or or um. Well, the thing he did was he went and flogged. He went and flogged the Apple One to Radio Shack, mm. and he he flogged them this idea of a computer. And then what they'd actually bought was the circuit board. It had no monitor. It had no case. It had no keyboard. It had nothing. And so they delivered the hundred that he'd sold them, and they, they kind of said, "Well, what's this?" And they said, "Well, that's what you bought." But they didn't know that, you know. Again, good salesman, you know, he went out and sold something, got the money, and then used the money to invest back in the business. That, to me, is the lesson of both of them. You know, if you want to, if you want to build a big business, you've got to be darn good at the marketing and sales, and get revenue flowing through so that you can reinvest it all the time. Yes, and I think it's. I mean, it surprises me 
I know. I think when you've been around for a long time and you've done the thing where you, you know, you talk people to network and you talk people to do all these things, and you think it's done because everybody of that period that you knew has all learnt that, and you kind of forget that it's not done, and then people turn up and then they say things like, um, "I need to spend ten grand on the website," and you're like, "What's your business proposition?" And they're like, "I don't have one." And I'm like, "Well, how are you going to build a website?" And I'm like, <laughs> because I need one. And it's like, or they'll say. What do you think of my business cards? You know, I think I think it's a bit, I'm going to spend this much on business cards, and you're like, well, "What's your business?" Why? And I haven't really figured it out yet. And I'm like, "But you know, you could just use LinkedIn and, and play, you know, you don't need any of that stuff until you've worked out your proposition. So just do a page, <laughs> get a Facebook page. Get what you just need. And I keep saying, you, know, you just need web presence. You don't need a website until you know what it is that you're selling." Yeah, no, exactly. But I, I don't know. I think it's I'm not even sure you need a website then, if one really gets down to it. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Go on. Sorry. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think for it depends on the nature of the business. If you're try, if you're trying to build the the big multi people big team business, then yeah, you probably do need websites and things. But if you're in a service business, you've you've left corporate and you're now acting as an independent consultant, whether you're with a limited company or not. You're not going to be working with that many clients at any one time, you know, a couple of dozen maybe at the most. Um, and so, you know, that's going to come through word of mouth and referral rather than from thousands of people signing up to a newsletter list on a website. I'm not saying that's, you know, that, that it's either or. I think, you know, if you've got both, even better. Um, but where do you put your focus? You know, and it's, it's, it's really being conscious and intentional about where you put the focus to get the next thing that you need in your business. And when. It's like, you know, I, I think that people do the web presence and I think it's good to have a website, but it's a case of when. So quite often you don't necessarily, you, you know, you don't necessarily need it even in the first year. If you're still working out what it is you're doing and you still, you know, you don't necessarily need to divert your attention into designing something that's pretty. No, that's right. That's right. Um, and, I mean, you know, I have for a long time, though. <laughs> you know, I have a website, and I have, you know, things on the website that are, um, that are there as a support to my clients. But then I also have things that are there to attract new clients. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm not saying don't have a website, but I'm saying be intentional about it. Know what it's for. Know who you're aiming it at um, before you spend a load of money. Um, for you know, don't quite know why. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, if we, if I'm going to answer the question again, tell me what your top three things would be. So, why Mavericks? Why do Mavericks need to look after themselves? So, I, I, I think they need to look after themselves because if they, if they are running a business or are important in, you know, one of the key people in a business, then when if they're not looking after themselves the business will struggle uh, if they are struggling in, in as individuals so the, the key thing is that the health of the health of the person reflects the health of the business and the health of the business reflects the health of the person they are so intimately interlinked that i don't think you can separate them um and you know the three things that i think are are really important in that are emotional awareness you know really understand what's going on emotionally with you as well as logically and factually but you know really understand that emotional thing from that will flow mental resilience that will enable you to uh, sail over the ups and downs of life and 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 you know make conscious intentional choices from a platform of strength and you know look after yourself physically as well because we only have one body and if we mess it around too much um you know then the rest of it doesn't matter anymore because we won't be here to for it to matter um so you know being really blunt about it if you're not if you're not well enough to run your business you don't have a business so you know it's worth it that's really good thank you for that um and annoyingly there's nothing i can disagree with with that one <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> Quite irritating when it's you. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that. And will, we, will you venture back for a third time? Oh, I'd be delighted to. Yeah. Let me know when. Great. Thank you. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with William, 
as much as I enjoyed having it. If you would like to learn more about Mavericks and leadership, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, apply to join the Maverick Paradox exclusive Facebook group. And my website is maverickparadox.com. Find out how willful independence can ultimately change all our futures. Thanks again and see you soon.